we have an awesome speaker. I know you guys are all excited to hear all about sex. So, here are some fun facts about our speaker. First off, she's a second class relic. Now I'm a third class relic. <laughs> she has shaken hands and personally met not only JP2, John Paul II, but also Mother Teresa. I'm holy by association. <laughs> she has spoken in 25 countries. Impressive. And she's the mother of six and has nine grandchildren and one on the way. Please yeah. give it up for Mrs. Thorne. So that's just stuff for you to ponder. Okay. Um, just by way of background, um, I started Project Rachel, which is the Catholic Church's post-abortion healing ministry many years ago. Um, those talks I've given in other countries, God brought me there to spread the word of healing and mercy. And in this year of mercy, it's important for us to know that God's mercy is for everyone. And many of you have friends who've had abortions, people in your family. When you talk about life issues, always talk about healing. Healed people never support abortion again. It's how we're going to end it, folks. Okay? So that's just my little plug for you. All right? Now, we're going to talk tonight about what they didn't tell you in sex ed. All right? There's so much that we don't know. And I got interested in this um, when our fourth child was born. And a priest friend introduced me to a woman who lived nearby. And we lived on the same block but opposite sides of the block. And there was an alley in between. And our kids were kind of the same age. And turned out they went to the same school. But we really hadn't met each other. So we got to be good friends. And when our fifth kids came along, they were born about three or four months apart. When our six kids were due, they were due the same day. I did not in a million years think that would happen. I was wrong. Um, our daughter, I went into labor midnight on March 23rd. Our daughter Miriam was born 7 a.m. on March 24th. Before she's born, my friend Joan's in the next room in labor. Now, John's birthday is the 25th, but it was within 24 hours. So it's one of those things you go, weird. Right? But I belong to a group called the Association of Pre- and Perinatal Psychology and Health. And it's the most pro-life group I know. They would tell you that they're not, but they really are. They believe babies begin at conception. They believe that what happens to us in utero is critical to who we become. How we're born is critical. Those first three years of life is critical. And on the way home, I'm reading a book by an anthropologist by the name of Sarah Hurdy, H-R-D-Y, called The Anthropology of, of Mothering. And I discovered what was going on with me and my friend. And that is, we women, when we spend time together, if we are not chemically contracepting, will come into what's called menstrual synchronicity. We get the period, our periods at the same time as our friends. Those of you who've lived on dorm floors know that there's that one week. <laughs> yeah, really, you know. I've been on campuses where they have mixed floors and the guys are like, that explains it that week we have to be gone. <laughs> if you value your life, you're gone, all right? It's not pleasant that week. But it was, we're made that way by God, and I'll explain why that is to you, all right? But that had me hooked. I was like, wow, we're communicating without knowing. This is by scent that this is set. And, and the purpose for this is that long ago, there weren't baby bottles, there wasn't formula. If I died, someone in my community had to be able to nurse my baby, or my baby would not survive. Someone, this someone, had to have a baby very close in age to my baby because newborn milk and toddler milk is not the same. A newborn will not survive on toddler milk, all right? So, that was God's way of making sure that the human race kept on moving, all right? That we, we didn't all die off. And it was just, it was fascinating. I just kept learning more and more, and. And I started thinking about this and I thought, you know, we live in these bodies, but we live in a society that leaves us to believe that we're disembodied. That whatever I intend up here in this top two inches of my head or so is what happens. So I can be engaged in hookup sex, and as long as I don't think there's any consequence, there's not. But you're wrong because you can't turn off your body. Your body is made to be body, mind, and spirit and for you to make intimate connections when we engage in intimate behavior. You're changed, all right? The more I learned, the more annoyed I got. I started telling women who called who had gotten pregnant the first time they had sex, 
how it was that they came to get pregnant because they were ovulating. And when we ovulate, we send messages <coughs> by scent and by look. And we're more likely to have sex when? When we're ovulating. Why? Because the ovum and the sperm only live a little while. There is only a very little window of the possibility of conception. God made us that way. But we need to understand this so that we make good decisions, okay? So I'm telling this to women, and they're going, why didn't I ever hear this? I said, that's a good question. Why didn't you ever hear this? You gotta tell other people this. Because if I had heard this, I might not have had to have an abortion. I might not have gotten pregnant. I might have made better decisions. Please promise me you'll talk to other people. It's out of that promise to those women that I'm standing before you guys tonight because this is important information that we need to know, okay? Now, I want to start by sharing a number with you, all right? The number, as soon as I get myself organized, this will go well, all right? This is the number. That's the number of cells in your body. They all know what they're doing. Or you wouldn't be sitting here as human beings. You would simply be a little blob. Well, probably a pretty big blob. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's a lot. But this a question of how awesomely we're made, all right, is really what we're going to talk about tonight. And I want to say to you that we are interconnected across generations. Again, we live in a society. We are so mobile. Um, you know, in the old days, we lived within a community, and it was our relatives and family, <laughs> friends, and they formed kinship, in, kinship relationships where you're really relatives by intention, okay? But we are impacted in so many ways by previous generations. And the first thing I want to say to you is that the Chinese say that we are more likely to get the diseases of our grandmother than our mother, and that being you. Why is that? Because when grandma, wait, grandma, mom, you. Wait. Oh, you guys are alert. All right. I use this other places. I do not get that reaction. All right. Uh, UWM does not cut it here. All right. But this awareness that if grandma is highly stressed when she was pregnant with mom, house burned down, dad, grandpa died, all the ovum that your mother had were already present in her body at 20 weeks into the pregnancy. That's halfway through her pregnancy. You women have all the ovum you are ever gonna have and you had them before you were born. And what went on in your mom's body when she was a tiny baby may have changed your ovum and who you are. You might be much more hypersensitive to stress if grandma was stressed. You might be more likely to get grandma's diseases than mom's diseases, okay? <coughs> It's fascinating when you think about this interrelationship across generations, all right? Now, the next thing is this. And this is something you cannot often say with accuracy. Everybody in the world, everybody in the world, carries the, the mitochondria. Those are the energy bodies in your cells. But hey, it's not just your mother. It's your mother's 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 back to seven lines of women with the scientific implication that there is an Eve. You can check this. National Geographic has it, Ancestry.com, some other places. About $100, they'll send you a little swab. You send them a cheek swab sample, and they will tell you which of the seven lines of women you came from. But they also tell you what their migrational pattern through history was. And there were probably three Eve figures, okay, in terms of, of, um, of, his, of um, Asians, Caucasians, and, Afri and, and Africans, okay, of, of those descendants. This is incredible. Now, you gentlemen not only have your mother's mitochondria, you have your father's why. And the guy who wrote about this um, first wrote about, it's called The Seven Daughters of Eve and talking about that mitochondria thing. And then he was at a conference and his last name is Sykes and there was another guy there named Sykes and the people, somebody said to him, hey, are you guys related? No, I don't think so. But it set off a question in his head. Is there something else that has the longevity 
across generations of the mitochondria. And it's your why, gentlemen. Your why is your father's 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 why, again, back generation upon generation. And the why is interesting because there are actually some markers on it. So for instance, in the Jewish community, <clears throat> where there is the tradition of the priestly caste, the men who are members of that priestly caste have a marker on their, on their why. <clears throat> and I first saw this, part of it written up, was US News and World Report, this research had come out, and so they were checking men's whys. And they checked the why of the man, a priest, down in New Mexico, and discovered that he had the priestly marker of the Jewish community. But now, historically speaking, in Spain, there was a large Jewish population at one point. So there would be the possibility of intermarriage. But this knowledge of how interconnected we are across generations is important for us to know. When we get to the reading it, it, around Christmas, it's before Christmas, about who begat, who begat, who, when you normally take a nap. <laughs> Pay attention. But better yet, go to scripture and look at it, because the full scripture has a woman's line and a man's line. How did they know that back then? What is that about? Apparently, it's something that we've known intuitively, and then we forgot because, well, you know, we're, we're much smarter than those people were. But very interestingly, there it is, okay? Now, a couple of other things. You, we women are XX, you guys are XY. The stronger of the two sexes is women. <laughs> because we have 3,500 to 6,000 genes on one of those X's and we have two. And what that means in our body is that these X's randomly assort, okay? So X1 might be your heart, X2 might be your spleen. Identical twin girls do not have identical bodies in spite of having identical genetics because of this, okay? You guys have 3,500 to 6,000 genes on that X and that's your mother's X. You actually have a larger inheritance from your mother here in terms of some things, all right? That Y is a little smaller. It's got 72. <laughs> <laughs> but what this means, guys, stay with me, guys. What this means is that we women, if I have something, a genetic inheritance here, color blindness, hemophilia, some kind of disease, as a woman, I am not likely to get it because these, these X's kind of balance each other out. You guys, if you inherit a color blindness from your mom or some genetic disease, you will show it because you have nothing. This doesn't match. They do different things in your body, okay? So that awareness. Far more boys are conceived than girls, but die in utero, infancy, toddlerhood, you know, a young boyhood, and then by the time you're this age, there should be about 105 men to 100 women, okay? The problem is that in some cultures, in China, India, North Korea, sex selection abortion is a real issue. And in those countries, we're running 120 to 135 men to 100 women. What does that mean? It means there are not spouses. It means the society tips heavily male. When a society tips heavily male, it is much more likely to become warlike because the balance for testosterone is, is very elevated, okay? What's happening in China, in India, North Korea, is that parents in rural areas are selling their daughters who are 11, 12, 13, 14, to whoever these traders are. They take them to the big city, to Beijing, to Shanghai, New Delhi, to, and sell them as supposedly wives, prostitutes. The problem is that these girls are running these are oftentimes brutal relationships. They don't know how to go home. They came from thousands and thousands of miles away from little villages that might not even be on a map. And this is becoming a ministry issue in those countries. How do we help these women? How do we find a safe place for them? And it's something we have to realize. When we mess with this stuff, we end up with consequences that we don't anticipate, okay? So that awareness. Now, <clears throat> a little bit, just a touch, about men and women were not the same. In spite of all the gender neutrality stuff, if they do brain scans, they can tell if you're a guy or a girl. Our brains are different, all right? And I want to share, when our kids were growing up, this is when the big push was for gender neutrality. And, and the um, recommendation was that 
Our boys get dolls and our girls get trucks. Okay, we got four daughters. They all got trucks. They all wrapped them in blankets. They gave them names. They had parties and naps. And we only think one of our daughters ever really checked out the truck because she can change her brakes. Her other sisters cannot do this. Right? She never acknowledged, but we have a hunch. Okay? So our boys got dolls. Now they're they're eight years apart. Son number one got his doll. He and the kid down the block decided dolls make great footballs. The doll lasted two weeks max. Never had a party, never had a nap, nothing. Looked like heck, we just threw it out, right? Son number two got a doll. And for a while there were these dolls called buddy dolls and they were boy dolls, they had tools and, and you know, cool coveralls and all that kind of stuff. And son number two really liked his buddy doll. And one Saturday we went grocery shopping and the older siblings were watching. The younger siblings and son number one decided they should play a game. It was called Sacrifice the Buddy Doll. <laughs> It's not a girl game, okay? Um, he didn't tell us about it until a few years ago. He's an adult now. And I didn't know what to say to him that I'm, I'm really sorry. And I said, you know, in midlife, we're sort of expected to go to therapy now for some reason. Um, you got something to talk about. And he says, yes. I do. It might indicate that there were other additional problems with his older brother that were not included in the Sacrifice the Buddy event. All right? But by and large, you men are linear thinkers and we women are multitaskers. Now some of us are, are some women are linear thinkers, some guys are multitaskers. We just have to know how we think. But the purpose of this, again, anthropologically, you men were hunters. You had to be single focused because you could not afford to be out in the woods skipping around chasing butterflies because you were gonna become lunch instead of bringing lunch home. And that's the end of the why. Don finished, all right? We women were living in the village. We were with other women. We had to be able to concentrate on several things. And long ago at a conference, there was a Catholic sister from California and a psychiatrist, a guy from Canada, and this is before the books that have been written about waffles and spaghetti and Mars and Venus and whatever. But they, this is what they concluded if we were gonna di draw diagrams. This would be a male brain. It's a series of boxes, all right? You guys go through all the boxes when you're thinking about something, all right? You are absolutely, you have an ability to stay absolutely single focused, all right? Now the problem with this is that when you guys were in school, this became a problem. Because if the teacher says, take out your pencil, or take out your paper, your pencil, and put your name on the top of the page, we girls are all over that. You guys don't get further than paper. <laughs> Spitballs, drawing. And what does the teacher say? You're not paying attention. No, you are paying absolute attention, all right? The ability to stay focused, all right? Now, we women, now back to one thing here. There's a guy in California who runs a school that I think is ingenious. And from kindergarten to 12th grade, he has boy classrooms and girl classrooms. And they're taught in the fashion. You guys do better moving around when you're learning, better with manipulation in terms of mathematics. It's geared to how your brain works, all right? So he told me something. I've been married to my husband a really long time. And that is that one of these boxes is empty. <laughs> we women do not understand this function, but when we say to you, what are you thinking about, and you reply, nothing, that's yeah, true. Yeah, they can do that. See, when they came back from hunting, they used to regroup. They would do fire gazing, and they would sit companionably side by side, really not saying much, but just regrouping. You see it happen in bars. <laughs> See the game, yeah. Okay, these are not profound conversations, all right? A little bit of information sharing. We women, if we were to draw our brain, would be like this, because we can do the following, which for you guys would be a challenge. We have observed the cats throwing up. The toddler's gone outside, supper is burning, and I need to go to the bathroom, and we rarely lose anybody in that, all right? Hard for guys to keep that many things. This is not about who's better or worse, it's about complementarity, all right? To understand that we, we complement each other in terms of these, these gifts, okay? Um, we women speak about 20,000 words a day. And our brain is set up with language and emotion close to each other and lots of spots. You guys, your language is on the left side of your brain. 
Your emotions are by the fear center of your brain. When we women say to you, what do you think, you know, how do you feel about something? You have to stop and think about it. We get mad because we think you should be able to, you know, we can do this in a heartbeat, right? About anything, any topic, you know? But we're different, okay, to appreciate that. Now, you guys speak fewer words, about 7,000. <laughs> Except at this point in your life, okay? But you guys tend to talk about measurable stuff. Scores, cars, things that are concrete. We tend to emote, right? Okay, if we're drawing pictures, you guys draw verbs, exploding things, okay? Cars, things that move, okay? Colors, usually blues, grays, black. We women draw nouns, love, butterflies, many colors, okay? So even on this elemental sense of, of you know, who we are, it's different. I gave this talk in Nebraska one night and I had an elderly farmer in the back of the room with his wife and I got to this point and his arm shot up. And his wife's looking at him like. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I didn't know if I should call 911 because she was looking not well. But I thought I'd ask, answer his question first. I said, what is it, sir? He said, 7,000 words? I have never said 7,000 words a day in my life. I have a lot of words left. And his wife is looking at him like, she just, he just wasted all those words on her, all right? But think about it. How does the conversation go? They were farmers. Dear, do you want breakfast? Uh-huh. You want coffee? Uh-huh. You gonna go work in the field today? Uh-huh. Now you see how we get to 20,000? Well, he's doing uh-huh over here. What? Just want us to appreciate each other, all right? It's important that we do this, okay? But for us, for us to be conscious of this, and there's a lot more in terms of differences, and it isn't, again, that one's better than the other, it's just that we're different. We need to appreciate that, we need to understand that. You know, when you women start developing relationships, your, your permanent relationship with your spouse, don't talk to him when he's reading the paper if you expect him to remember. Because brain scans show he's effectively deaf. Okay? Dear, did you hear what I said? I still do this. I know this. I still do this. Did you hear what I said? Huh? Uh, no? Huh? Okay. This is about communication to the point of understanding and appreciating where it breaks down. Okay? Now, as we talk about the rest of this, okay, God made us in an awesome fashion. We have to understand the complexity of our bodies because it's so important. And we don't, okay? We don't have any idea about how awesomely we're made how God made us for bonding, okay? In scripture, it says two become one. You go, yeah, well, what do they know? I'll explain to you how that happens, that's true. We have to appreciate the way that we are, we are built and the way that God made us. And now, one of the things I wanna say to you is that this is another relatively unknown fact, that mothers carry cells from every child they ever conceive the rest of their life. Microchimerism, all right? Why is that significant? One, it's impossible for a mother to forget her children, okay? Women have the, the cells of their children and they stay there the rest of their life. This is really, really important. Furthermore, you carry your mother's cells the rest of your life and probably grandma's cells. These cells are active in your body in the mother, we know that your cells morph into brain cells, kidney cells, whatever. So I have cells in all my organs of my body from all of my children. If there is a miscarriage or an abortion, we carry more cells from those children. We don't know why. There's an NIH article that says that their estimate is that 500,000 cells are transferred in an abortion. But the reality is those cells were present long before the abortion happened. Because by four weeks into the pregnancy, that's before we know we're pregnant, the cells of our children are already there. Our scent changes, now these scent things I'm talking about are called pheromones, okay? P-H-E-R-E -E or O, M-O-N-E-S, pheromones. They are scent molecules of affiliation. They are perceived by two pits in the septum of your nose and they communicate with a very small nerve right here behind your forehead. All right? They communicate familial information, people information, all right? For instance, if I give you three piles of t-shirts, 
your t-shirts, guy t-shirts, girl t-shirts. Eight out of 10 of you will correctly identify your t-shirt by scent. Seven out of 10 would discriminate male from female, and that's kind of the broadest of the discriminations, okay? Different. We women smell sweet, that's how it's described, and you men smell the male, the masculine sort of scent is musk. That's why it's an aftershave. That's why it's in cologne. It's a distinctly male scent, okay? We know all kinds of things, all right? When you are born, you already know the scent of your mother because the amniotic fluid smells like your mother. If you were placed on her belly with no assistance, you would make the way to her breast and start to nurse. Why? Because there are, are, are glands on, the, on our nipple that smell like us, that give off pheromones. The baby recognizes this. For you men, those first hours after birth, you need to do skin-to-skin -skin touch with your baby because he, he or she needs to learn your scent. They know your voice from in utero, but they need to learn that scent thing. There's 12 hours where the baby is hypersensitive to scent, and the scent that the baby smells during that time will help to calm it later. So when you're holding and cuddling your baby, that's, that's a calming thing for the child, okay? Now, this is important because there's more to this. So your mother carries your cells, you carry her cells. How many of you have older brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, guess who cells you carry? Your mom gave them to you during pregnancy? My youngest daughter concluded that she had gotten the best cells of her older siblings, and she was by far my exceptional child, and if you need to use that, please do. I made her feel better. Okay. We don't know what those sibling cells do precisely, but we do know that if there's a child missing in the family, miscarriage or abortion, people sometimes know that. They'll say, I always thought I was supposed to have a big brother big sister and they haven't been told okay it's this biological knowledge somehow our body reads the cells that are there you know does this hmm somebody's missing so that awareness now this is an interesting piece again this is a an article on this microchimerism business and I just want to read you just this little bit from it it talks about surgical abortions delivering up to 500,000 nucleated fetal cells to the woman's circulation but as I said she's already got a lot of these there. Now, this question, they use, they look at the Y marker because in a woman's body, our daughters are XX, so are we. It would be hard to discriminate, you can do it, but it's high-tech expensive genetics, okay? But if I'm carrying XY, it's not me, all right? So this question of how they get there. So it says, interestingly, male microchimerism has been found in a fifth of women with no male births. This can occur in a number of ways, including an early miscarriage of a male embryo, a vanished male twin, male cell transfer from an older sibling through the maternal circulation to a later pregnancy, or an unexplored possibility of male DNA transfer to the woman's circulation from sexual intercourse. That's, that's almost scary, okay? But that's what they're talking about in terms of the, the complexity of this, okay? Now what we know is this, if the baby is born with a disability, our mother cells cluster like they're trying to fix it, all right? In our, mother cell, in our mother's body, ours, if we have an illness, if we have the proper partner, which I'm gonna say something about in a minute, the cells of our children cluster like they're trying to fix it, all right? There is an oncologist on at Penn State who heard me do this talk and said, Vicki, let me tell you what I'm working on. He said, when I have a woman who has cancer, I check to see if she has the biologically correct mate, which I'll tell you in a minute. If she does, then I see if she has sons. If she has sons, I extract the sun cells from her body, I inject them into the tumors, and the tumors disappear without any ill to the woman. How awesome is that, okay? Now this business about the right partner. <clears throat> we women have been given a gift by God. When we first meet a guy, by scent, we recognize whether he might be the right, the right biological mate, all right? If I'm not contracepting, I'm attracted to a male whose immune system is a complement to mine, quite different. This little bit of overlap is my father's immune system. This is a fertility possibility. Now, ladies, just because he smells nice does not mean it's a done deal. <laughs> you gotta find out if he's worth it or not, okay? <laughs> This may not make him a nice person, all right? What we're reading is something called the MHC complex, major histocompatibility complex, all right, oops. 
And if I'm chemically contracepting, it totally changes who I pick. And I'm attracted to a male whose immune system is very much like my father's or my brother's. This is a fertility challenge for starters. When I go off the pill, there is no sexual attraction. It is nails on a chalkboard. 70% of women are the ones who will start divorces. All right? This is the partner. We need, to be, we need to know that. And people go, well, but I'm on the pill because the doctor put me on it for acne or for whatever. If you're looking for a mate, you need to go off it. There was an article written in Britain, it was one of the first articles I saw in this, on the fact that they recommend if you've been on the pill, you're living with someone, okay, it's cohabitation city, um, <clears throat> you should go off the pill for a period of time. They don't know how long, because it takes a while to come out of our body. And then have your partner wear the same t-shirt for three days with nothing scented. So no scented soap, aftershave, or whatever. And then to smell the t-shirts and see if he smells good or not. Because if he smells good, fertility is a possibility. If not, he's the wrong biological partner. You need to know that. I did this talk at a, at a Protestant megachurch in Milwaukee, and I had two college guys who came up afterwards and said to me, Mrs. Thorne, we have made a decision. I said, yes, gentlemen, what is it? If a girl finds us attractive, our first question is going to be, are you on the pill? <laughs> and I said, well, it won't make you popular, but it will make you happy. Right? But we need to be, I mean, we really need to think about these things. And the last time I was here, there was someone who had heard me say that, probably on the YouTube, and came up and said, Mrs. Thorne, you know, I heard you talk about those two guys. I asked the same question. All right? So this awareness of what happens to us in terms of, of these experiences, all right? Now, we women, and this is elemental, but sometimes we need to be reminded, we have two ovaries the size of almonds, all right? We have fallopian tubes, which kind of encircle it, but don't necessarily touch it, all right? Our, our uterus cervix all right every other month one of our ovaries produces ovum now let me back up a minute you boys when you're turning into a boy because when we are conceived for a very little while it's a female body and you guys on your Y have something called an SRY and when the SRY triggers your male genitalia form the hormones change. There are two sets of ducts that are normally in our bodies. One is called the malarian. They're, both of these are here at conception. And the other is called wolfian. You guys now produce something that's called the malar malarian inhibiting, inhibiting substance, because these are what create girl parts. Now, your boy parts are good to go, all right? But this is so interesting, because there's not the same trigger for women's bodies. Ours just continued, continued to grow. But for you males, that SRY and the Y is very significant. All right? So every other month, there will be about 10 ovum that begin to develop. Now, they've actually been developing for about a year. But now these are the ones for this month, OK? We need to know that in our male and female bodies, the area in the male body that produces sperm, which is ongoing in production, is the same set of cells in that very early body that cause us to produce our ovum. Now, our ovum are already all present in our body at 20 weeks. When we were, when we were you know, really little, we had six million of them, okay? By the time we're born, we're down to about two million. And by the time we get our period, we have about 400 to 450,000 left, okay? Interestingly, in our woman bodies, in the course of a lifetime, we will usually have 400 to about 450 periods, okay? But they just eventually die off, okay? Now, these are developing when you get to mid-cycle ovulation. Ovulation is about 14 days before your next period, all right? Something sets off which will be actually released. And there's usually one or two in the human being multiples, triplets, quadruplets, six sextuplets, octuplets are almost unheard of, all right? They happen occasionally, but they're very rare. It has to do with the fact as mammals, 
that we can sustain the number of, of infants that we have nipples for. So we can sustain twins if we were only nursing, all right? Triplets, but it'd be a, a, it's a major draw in our body if we're only nursing. Animals have multiple nipples, so they will produce litters. We humans aren't designed to do that, okay? Now, interestingly, one in eight of us is conceived as a twin, but only one in 80 of us is born as a twin. We lose our twin, it's called a vanishing twin syndrome. We carry a lot, of <clears throat> a lot of cells from our twin, and there's this intuitive knowledge that someone is missing, okay? Um, you know, if this is touching something, you pay attention to it, okay? You've got biological knowledge. And I first discovered that and got involved when a daughter of mine, I, I was giving a talk and someone gave me an article on this twinning and the vanishing twin. And I knew she was a twin. Now, I didn't know what I knew about cells now. And, and I said to my husband, but I'm not gonna tell her. God's gotta tell her because she's got five aborted cousins her age. She has a miscarried sister before her and a brother after her. And I said, I don't wanna set off something that isn't true. Not two months later, she woke me up in the middle of the night and she said, Mom, I was praying and I think I'm a twin. Now, if God hadn't given me this heads up, I never would have said yes. I said, I think you are too. Is it a boy or a girl? She goes, it's a boy. His name is Joseph Francis. That's why I'm so bonded to my brother behind me and why all my best friends have been guys. I've been looking for my brother. Okay? So this complexity here. All right? When we ovulate, these ovum are kind of just set loose here. And there are little hair-like cilia here and they will suck the ovum into the fallopian tube because this isn't connected. And then they begin to move, all right? Now, there's more to this. You gentlemen have three kinds of sperm. These are highly technical terms. Egg getters. <laughs> Pay attention. Blockers. And killers. <laughs> man by the name of Robin Baker in England wrote about this. I think he might have played rugby. It's just a hunch. All right. The egg getters are the smooth, sleek sperm. Their goal is to, to get close to the ovum and potentially fertilize it. Blockers are irregularly shaped. And we used to go, oh, there's something wrong with them. No, they're on purpose because they fill in crypts in our cervix to keep make it possible for the egg getters to get through. All right. Killers are benign, unless we women have had multiple partners in a short period of time in which case the killers of all the men we've had sex with are, are triggered, they are highly poisonous, their intent is to kill the sperm of the other guy. You'll see there are some sports analogies on a very cellular level. All right. All right. The problem with this is that it changes the chemistry of our uterus. Our uterus is normally acidic. You males, you're alkaline. The last thing that goes on sperm before it leaves your body is a coating of vitamin C so that we don't, it's not immediately killed in our system, all right? We have to recognize the complexity of all that. When these killer sperm are activated, it changes the chemistry here. It now becomes alkaline, and we are very potentially uh, open to a nasty infection called bacterial vaginosis. It requires treatment, ASAP, all right? But you see that all these things that are going on here, all right? Now, the other thing is this. Many sperm are not capable of entering an ovum until they are changed in the body of our loved one. They sit here at the base of the fallopian tube for a few hours. They undergo something called capacitation, all right? What does it do? It changes the head, so now the head can enter the ovum. It changes the way it swims and they are now released kind of in waves with that question of meeting the ovum. Now, you may not know this. It's the ovum that picks the sperm. Out of all those sperm that get there, the ovum goes, that one. <laughs> Somehow <laughs> communicates, that one gets there. There is chemical, chemical interaction going on, and now this is the sperm that enters the ovum. And the others can't do that, and there's only one place apparently on the ovum where it can enter, all right? And when it enters, this part falls away. I said the mitochondria is only of the mother. This is the reason. The mitochondria is present in the egg. The mitochondria carried by the sperm is back here. When the tail falls away, the mitochondria of the male disappears. Okay? This is the center line of our body in terms of development. Okay? This now signals our mother bodies and a way an area is being prepared for the placenta. It will move down and it builds the placenta. 
All right, the baby does. Now, we need to know a couple of things. We have been told <coughs> that, sper that, that THC is benign. Pot is not benign. Pot damages sperm. Go online and look it up. This is very serious. The chemistry of THC is also very similar, and we women may have the pot, you know, the chemistry in our bodies too, because it sits there for a while. It's very similar to this chemistry. So if it's present, it might block these receptor sites. It's also similar to the chemistry here that's going on. Again, if THC is present, it may interfere with the receptor sites. All right? Now, another thing about you men. Do not carry your cell phone in your pants pocket. The radiation damages your sperm. This is when you are allowed to remove it. Dead serious about this. Get <laughs> Come on, guys. Take them out. Take them out. You know, there we go. See ya. You know, get, get one of those, um, the radiation proof holders, and, you know, carry it up higher, like on your belt. Okay? Now, we women, we haven't done as much research on us, but you think about where are we carrying our cell phones? Often here. What's right there? Your ovaries. Okay? There is some indication that when we tuck them here in our, in our bra, that there's a potential cancer issue there. Right? We have to make good decisions. Okay? Again, this is stuff where have you heard this before? Also, do not work with your laptop directly on your lap for the same reason. There's radiation there, okay? We have to recognize it, all right? Now, a couple of other things here. I have to talk fast because we have to be out of here at 7, all right? Um, we need to know that seminal fluid is one of the most complex fluids in the human body. We think it's a carrier. It's not. It's got 30 different compounds. 30 different compounds in there that have to do with our immune system, with your immune system, with, with enhancing the sperm, with allowing it to swim better, all kinds of things. And then there's a bunch of hormones, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, prostaglandins. What's wrong with this picture? Those are all woman hormones. We absorb them, people, for 15 hours after every active intercourse. We are physiologically changed by every active intercourse because we're, we're absorbing all this chemistry. In the old days, we did not get our periods until we were 15, 16. And they were never regular until we had our partner. Suddenly, we had regularized periods. Follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone have to do with her ovulation and with, with setting our, our system, okay? Much we have tinkered with that we don't understand all of this, okay? But this, again, the complementarity, it's not just his body, this is for our body, okay? Now, that business about two becoming one, if I am carrying the cells of my children, am I not carrying the DNA of my husband? I am. There you have it, okay? Profound when you think about it. It's stuff that we, we don't, you know, nobody's told us again, and it's stuff we need to know. Now, a couple of other things. This whole question of chemical contraception, all right? <laughs> you would think that, you know, this is God's gift to women, all right? And I wanted to share you, with you just a little piece. There was a news story that came out this week. Interesting. It says, double standard, male birth control study canceled due to side effects. A new study shows that hormonal birth control shots for males could effectively prevent pregnancy in female partners. But further studies were canceled after men involved in the study experienced side effects, primarily depression. The decision to curtail the studies is ironic considering the growing evidence that hormonal birth control has similarly negative side effects for women, except even more. All right. For these men, um, it says the latest study, over a million women showed that the birth control pill greatly increases a woman's risk of dep depression, exponentially so among teenage girls. It's generally expected, especially, accepted, especially after reviewing the evidence gathered over 55 years since the pill was approved, that 20 to 30% of women on hormonal birth control have experienced depression severe enough to require antidepressants. There's another 20% that are depressed, but not quite so depressed. 
Contraception bears negative consequences for a vast number of women compared to the depression experienced by a mere 3% of the 320 men who received the trial birth control shot. Something wrong with that? Yeah, okay. Now, we women have to understand, and you men have to know this, that there are all kinds of issues. I organized a conference last year at Georgetown on this, just a scientific symposium. One, the question of partner choice. Two, the World Health Organization says that hormonal contraceptives are a type one carcinogen. Why aren't we told that? You know, in my more cynical moments, I suggested to some people that the little sisters of the poor who are being required to pay for contraceptives ought to, ought to require that other employers be required to pay for all of their employees' use of another one of the type one carcinogens, tobacco. Wouldn't it be fair that you should, you know, your employer should buy tobacco for you? It's absurd. That's the bottom line, all right? We women, when we're on the pill for a long time, our brain changes. It grows like a male brain. We see the world as men see it, not as we see it. That does not promote the feminine genius. If I give you a picture, this is something called emotional memory. There's an accident. You guys will focus on the core of the accident. We women who are not contracepting, We'll see the accident and the peripherals. So there's a puppy over here, there's a fire hydrant over here. Woman on the pill, we'll see it as a man. We need to know this stuff, okay? Now, what else? What about, what about blood clots? You know the risk of that? My daughter's best friend died five years ago, collapsed on a campus, was on the pill for health reasons. Filled with blood clots, got them out of her lungs, got them out of her heart, couldn't get them out of for the rest of her body. Her, she was awake and her parents had to tell her they were gonna let her die. That shouldn't have happened, people. They had no idea that that was a potential risk, okay? What other things are there? Nutritional deficiencies, the depression and the mood swings, loss of libido, how ironic. It kills our libido. The thing that's supposed to set us sexually free kills our ability to appreciate. That, that just shouldn't be there. There's pelvic pain, pelvic pain. There's a certain type of very, type of very rare um, brain cancer that's affiliated. Gallbladder, thrombosis, again, those are strokes and blood clots. It shrinks our ovaries and makes our ovum old. If we have been on the pill from the years we're in the teens, by the time we're 30, we may have old ovaries and old <coughs> ovum. It's a fertility challenge, okay? Other things, if there's Crohn's disease in your family, you're more likely to get it. We are giving free of charge to the women in sub-Saharan Africa, Depo-Provera, which is the shot. Now, the shot, demineralizes our bones by 7% a year. We women are not told that. It increases the breast cancer risk also along with, with the, the pill. But what they've discovered in Sub-Saharan Africa is that the women who've gotten this wonderful gift of Depo-Provera are now getting HIV at a three times higher rate. What is that? That's, that's not helpful to women, okay? It impacts our pituitary. This is the master gland of our body. We need to know this. now. In terms of how you men are, are impacted by this, there is an anthropologist by the name of Lionel Tiger, and yes, his mother named him that, and he wrote a book with Robin Fox, and yes, apparently his mother named him that also. Um, Lionel Tiger is this feisty, 80-something-year-old man, brilliant guy, and he has written a lot about men's societies. How do guys relate to each other? The fact that when you men are together, your testosterone is elevated. You're watching the football game they lost. Yeah, drops right out the bottom. Um, <laughs> But these, these different pieces of how men, you know, relate to each other. When the pill came out, he thought this had an impact on men. And so he did something. He took a colony of monkeys to an island. There was one male, a bunch of females. And the one male was faithful to three of the females. He didn't look at the others. When they put them on chemical contraceptives, he lost interest. And now he took up with three different ones. When they put the whole community of females on contraceptives, Austin fared poorly. He lost interest in the girls, his sperm, plot, his sperm count plummeted, and he masturbated excessively. When they took the females off and they came back into, into cycling, sperm count came back, masturbation ceased, and he went back to his first three females. We need to know in this world there are 68 million on women on hormonal contraceptives. Why is that significant? Because it means you guys are flatlined. If women are not ovulating around you, your testosterone is not doing what it is supposed to do. When you are with an ovulating woman, just even in, in casual encounter, 
your testosterone goes up because there's pheromones involved in, in communicating this. We, you guys are more interested. We women dress to impress when we're ovulating. Strangers looking at pictures, you know, a whole month of you, they can pick out the ovulating you. A little more color in our cheeks, a little better makeup, hair is a little better, a little bit of decolletage, perhaps a lot of decolletage. <laughs> and guess what? Both of us at this point are interested in sex. Why? Because there's this little window of opportunity for conception. And, and God built us this way saying, pay attention folks, this is it, okay? Now a little information could be a problem. Um, in our family, when my two younger daughters heard about this, and one of them is affectionately known as Miss Never Had an Unspoken Thought, her younger <laughs> sister came down, and her younger sister is pretty much a conservative dresser. And this day, she had a little more makeup on, she had a little decolletage, her big sister says, what are you ovulating, go put your clothes on. <laughs> little knowledge, good or ill, okay? This awareness of how we are changed even in terms of our relationships. You won't be able to see this in the back, but the headline says, a 10 second kiss is long enough to transfer 80 million bacteria. Your mouth is changed when you kiss your partner. But the purpose for this, as God made it, that I have my partner with whom I'm intimate, with whom I will have children, is that those bacteria pass through my body, through the placenta to the baby, and begin to implant the biome of the family. That's awesome. Okay, and you think about that. The other thing that happens with birth is when I give birth, coming through the birth canal, we are exposed to the bacteria of our, of our mother's body, which begins to plant it in our body. That's the genetics that we're geared for, okay? There's questions being raised about there now about, you know, in the sort of planned C-sections. Because the baby isn't, isn't starting birth. Babies start birth. Okay, and what happens is the baby doesn't get exposed to what it's supposed to get exposed to in terms of either chemistry and or this bacteria. And so now there are a few doctors who have read about this who are starting to inoculate the baby, would take a vaginal swab and at least expose the baby to our bacteria. But you see, it's gotten so complicated and it's really problematic. All the things that we don't know. When we fall in love, Intimacy should be reserved for that because your bodies are changed forever. Gentlemen, when you have intercourse with someone, when you have, are engaged in intimacy, you get hormones that bond you to that woman. Whatever your intention is, those hormones are there and you're bonded. You can walk away, but you're changed, all right? Same is true for us women. We've got, bio, we've got oxytocin, we've got other things. Our bodies are physiologically changed by intimacy. We need to make good choices because our goal is to have a happy life, is it not? To marry a partner with whom we can share a lifetime. I've been married to my husband 45 years. I wouldn't trade it for anything, okay? But that awareness of this, this that's how God made us, okay? Society said, oh no, there's no problem. You can have random sexual encounters, all that kind of thing. That's where heartbreak comes from. I've spent my life picking up the pieces of people's hearts that are broken because of abortions. Not only women, men. Men suffer too. And the one thing I forgot to say, and I will say this in conclusion, is you men are changed by pregnancy biologically. Did you know that? You're told you're just sperm donors, but it's a lie. <laughs> by four weeks when those, ba those cells are in me, you know by scent that she's pregnant and your body starts changing. And your cortisol, which is your stress hormone, but it's also your bonding protector hormone, starts to rise, all right? Then 60 to 90% of you will experience couvade, C-O-U-V-A-D-E, French for hatching. You got symptoms with her, gentlemen. 20% are really sick and they go to the doctor and say, oh, I'm really sick. I'm throwing up, I'm nauseous, I got headaches and backaches and toothaches. Um, I've got, um, I don't sleep well, I'm anxious. Um, I have food cravings, and, 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 seriously. And I've gained about six pounds if it's a little later in pregnancy. Our doctors have never heard of this for the most part, and they say it's a virus. It's not a virus, you are in the dance. About six weeks before the baby comes, your hormones go crazy. Your testosterone drops like a rock. Okay? You get more estrogen, and these two things make you more protective. You see, excessive estrogen. <laughs> Stay with me, people. I'm supposed to be done by now. 
Okay, excessive testosterone makes people aggressive. This isn't a time for a father to be aggressive. This is a time for a father to be caring, all right? Nature's taking care of this. Then you get more cortisol, again, to protect and to bond. You get vasopressin, which is a sexual bonding hormone. You men, this is what happens when you're engaged in, a, in an encounter with someone. You get a lot of vasopressin, and it gives you preference for her. You're bonded to her. You can't turn this off. Right now, this is Mother Nature. Sit, stay, don't abandon. And then you get prolactin. Yeah, that's the nursing hormone. You got it for six weeks. You're extra nice. Okay, women, at this point, you can get away with. Dear, I know it's uh, 11.30. Would you mind getting me Starbucks and diapers? He's all over it. Okay? But then, when it starts to drop, he says, you know it's 11.30, right? How about Starbucks in the morning and diapers after work? Okay? The other day I had a father say to me, and I've given this talk in a lot of places, you know, I'm a little suspicious of that. I said, why? He said, because I would have done anything to get out of changing diapers. <laughs> I said, I'm going to tell people that, okay? But the other thing that happens is your brain changes. Your brain develops into a better thinking organism in terms of being able to care for the young. We need to recognize that you men become fathers and that God made this happen. In that first pregnancy, something doesn't return completely to normal. It is that your testosterone goes up but does not return to its pre-pregnant state. You went from being a hunter aggressor to being a protector provider. You have adequate testosterone, but you are a bonded father and partner. How awesome is that in terms of how God has made us, okay? So, hopefully you've heard something you didn't know, all right? Um, you know, I think they're giving cash refunds for what you paid for dinner tonight if you didn't learn something, so you can see Kristen. Um, we can talk about this stuff. This stuff is on the internet. You can share this with your friends. People say that this talk changes their lives. And it's not me saying that. They come up to me and say, I heard you at World Youth Day in Madrid. I heard you. That talk changed my life. And so it's my hope that you come out of here tonight with a new understanding of how awesomely you're made that there are all these parts here that God built in, in terms of causing us to grow, to become parents, to make good choices, that's important. And I'll be around afterwards if you've got questions that you wanna ask. If you want to email me a question, I will give you an email address. Okay. Vicki Thorne, V-I-C-K-I, T-H-O-R-N, 2004, okay at yahoo.com now if you do not hear from me within a week resend it when i travel i do not travel with a computer because i'm often i'm doing many many talks um sometimes things that are important don't land where they're supposed to they're somewhere in the cloud so if you don't hear from me in two in a week or so i literally please send it again okay i'll do my best to answer to point you to whatever you need to know so thank you very much and god bless you all and please keep me in prayer would you give to a young woman whose doctor has prescribed chemical contraception to them, maybe not for the purpose of right. chemical contraception, but because that's, that's, I think, something that um, to be informed so that they can talk to their OBs yeah. and their GP. Yeah. <clears throat> and when you raise this with their doctors, they're going to say, oh, I didn't know that. My son-in-law, the doctor, who just graduated from medical school, got one hour on contraception. All right? Wow. One hour. So this question of being an informed consumer, I will tell you that for a lot of those things, if you can find an APRO technology doctor, they can solve that with other things. Okay, not with a pill. NAPRO Tech, go online, look up NAPRO Technology, look up Pope Paul VI Institute, which is at Creighton University, but doctors and, and providers are all over the country. Go see them, because this question of what the pill can do to your body is so grave. And you know, people go, even when you read the medical reports, it's like, well, you know this brain cancer thing. I mean, it's deadly, but it's not very many people. You know, it's more important that you have this disability. Hey, if it's you, it is 100%. 
I gave a talk one day to a um, group of women, and they were dubious about the, the blood clot thing. I could tell they were dubious. And over here is a woman, and she raised her hand, and she said, I'm here to tell you that I had three strokes in my 20s as a result of being on the pill. They told me I would never walk or talk again. It's a miracle that I'm here, but we need to understand this is a possibility, okay? So we need to be informed consumers. This stuff is online, you can find it. Carry it with you to the doctor, okay? Find doctors who know something about this and share the information amongst yourselves, okay? Where you find a doctor who knows how to treat this stuff. It's so important, and we, we get sold as bill of goods, Father, in terms of this is such good medicine and it takes care of everything. We need to know when we are on the pill, what we is called a period is not our period. It is hormonal breakthrough bleeding. It doesn't do the same thing as your period. Yes, it's regular because you took all the pills, and when you quit, your hormones kick in. But it's not your normal period. Your normal period is designed to clean your entire system, it, and it coincides with ovulation. When you're on the pill, you're not ovulating. And this is a different kind of physiological experience. Okay? Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you.